getting that sorted. Well, we're actually live now. Oh, oh um, we're, we're, um, we're live. So welcome to, to Alex Hawley and Sarah Hillary. And we're waiting for Imogen Church, which is probably entirely my fault. I've become so used to doing this over the last few days. I sometimes forget people to tell people the complicated things they have to do in order to log in. And now Alex has gone blank. Oh, so it's me and Sarah. Oh, but, you know, no. <laughs> we'll on. This just proves how wonderful. Oh, Alex I'm gone blank. That's, like, that's very odd, isn't it? It's Alex, like, can you hear us? Oh. Oh, no. Oh. Alex, anyway, if you can hear us, put a message in the message bar. We can, we can, people can hear us and we're fine and we're live. Um, oh, we come back in the fullness of time. Um, but anyway, welcome, Sarah. I realise I put your, your slogan right in your face. Let me lower it a little bit. There you go. Um, Sarah Hillary was here um, probably about fortnight ago or slightly longer actually no i think i was fairly near the beginning just right after was julia your julia crouch your first that's right yeah too now it seems it seems like you've been doing this for like a year i did amazing time time has become the strangest thing hasn't it it's really um, um but while you while you're there and nobody else is um Sarah's going to be looking for messages from Imogen at the same time, but I want to ask, while she's trying to concentrate on two screens, in the time, when I, between the time I last um, spoke to you and yeah. now, you had a very important announcement in the bookseller magazine about your new yeah. project. I kind of knew about, but I didn't know about. Um, but you've got a complete, you've, having been doing the Marnie Rome series, you're also doing something different right now. That's absolutely correct. Hi, Susan, by the way, in Australia. Um, she was international audience Fantastic. <laughs> um um yes it is complete so this is my first standalone so i've never written a standalone before well not a published one um and um it's uh it's a new publisher um i'm returning in fact to my original commissioning editor vicky meller um at pan mcmillan so um vicky was the editor who bought someone else's skin um, and and the first and you know was with me for the first four books in the Marnie Rome series um, so it's nice to be you know I feel in a way it feels like returning home um, but um, but it was uh, and, and actually ugly and, and just as time would um, chance it hello um, lots of very exciting people here coming in it's filling up the chat bar isn't it it's quite a <laughs> quite a thing hi guys um, so yes yeah, so my first standalone um, new publisher Book's not out till 2021, and it never was due to be out until then. So it actually, you know, took some of the the pressure off, um, you know, everything that's going on at the moment. I think it had been originally intended to come out this year. It would have been um, quite a, you know, a, 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 an extra hurdle to leap over. I do feel for everybody who's um, got books out at the moment. Um, so, yes, it's, um, I suppose, I, I've been hawking it around the bazaars as they, taught me to say in the Navy, um, as um, the as Rebecca meets the handmaid's tale. Um, hi, Alex. We have Alex. Hi, sorry, about, hi. sorry yep. about the delay. It's good to see you again. Thank you. So, <laughs> now we yeah. just need Imogen. I'm going to see if I can quickly check and see if, she's, if I've had a message from her. Uh, no, I no messages since she was going to try and download the app to her phone. She's running around the house. I love this. I did yeah. sort of, you know, it's... Almost certainly entirely my fault, and I'm going to have to do some serious groveling. Oh, I I wouldn't, I'm, worry, William. I'm sure Imogen will understand because it's oh, all no. a new to all of us, really. This kind of thing, isn't it? But um, it, anyway, welcome, Alex. Alex Hall is here because um, our main subject of the day is audiobooks, to which Imogen Church is a really respected and very successful and really wide open. Uh, she's done all sorts of, of uh, titles, including Sarah Hillary's. Um, title as narration and I'm fascinated with audiobooks at the moment because a lot of people are suddenly turning to them in quite large numbers I mean before they've been something that people tend to do on commuter journeys and stuff like that and I kind of think people are wanting to do them now just because they're consuming because you can consume them at home they're a different way of consuming books and also there's a human voice on the other end which I think can be quite good right now but well, Alex yeah Alex, Alex, you've been we written written about 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 million last year what's that okay. The audio book market went up by six and nine million last year. No, you're joking. That's significant, isn't it? And it's yeah. all coming from writers' pockets, I'm sure, Sarah. Oh, I'm feeling it, aren't you? 
but t- tell us what got you into audiobooks, Alex. Um, I'm dyslexic, so it's the only way I can use them. And I run my entire website purely on that. Right. So tell me, I mean, tell me about dyslexia for a start. Did you all, were you always aware that reading was a problem or was this come to you? You know, how did you figure this out? Well, I've never been able to read um, at all apart from chucking the book across the room. So audio, <laughs> audio books were my only option, really. Um, the first one was The Hobbit. Was there a one for The Hobbit? Now, you know, because audiobooks, you tend to think now that, you know, there were audiobooks, but presumably when you were first consuming audiobooks, there weren't that many titles. Oh, there were loads. I've been doing it for 30 years, but through tape, cassette, not CD. Right. Wow. That takes me back. It does. That reminds what... me of taping, t- taping TV programmes onto cassette tapes before VCR. <laughs> yes, that's how old I am. <laughs> Yeah, yeah well, I could I could predate that. I remember I remember seeing the first cassette players coming out. I'm that old, but anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, by the way, yeah. I, can I just Sorry. say I've heard from Imogen. Yeah, um, and she is she's been uh, thwarted. She's she doesn't have Facebook, so she's been trying to log in via YouTube. Which oh, okay, that won't work. Oh, you see, this is why my whole you can do it. It says you can log in using um, YouTube, um, or, but it won't let her. So um, I think that's because we're we're broadcasting on Facebook. I didn't realise that. What a catastrophic error on my part. Yeah, we're gonna have, yeah, I'm gonna have to get Imogen back on stage. The only thing is I'd say, Imogen, if uh, it is create a Facebook profile and, and join us for the last ten minutes, and then you can destroy your Facebook profile afterwards. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, believe it or not, or, I don't like Facebook. Okay. But anyway. Um, Caroline Hazeldine says, hi, Alex. Um, hi. That's one of my uh, um, friends and care assistants. Right, right. So the other thing is you've got cerebral palsy, so you are yeah. um, wheelchair-bound, which people can't see from where you are, but we, that we, when we tend to meet you, you're rocking up to Harrogate in a wheelchair and stuff like that. So yeah. I was thinking about this earlier. For us we're suddenly finding it incredibly frustrating because we're stuck at home. Um, for you, this is probably not such a novel experience. No, I'm always at home. I only come out four times a week. Um, book events are the, one of the biggest reasons I get out of the house. No, that it's be- like it to have that to go to. So it's a bit, a bit destroying that this summer has gone so quiet. Oh, yeah. Um, Harrogate, for example, um, that... That is my whole my whole year up until that's over, and then it's bloody Scotland, right? Yeah. I mean, but you also do a lot online. You've got your own website, um, Alex Hawley Reviews, but you're also yeah. part of a a, um, a um, member of UK Crime Book Club. Yeah. And it's been really interesting these last few days watching. This is a private book club, which if you're on Facebook, unlike Imogen Church, you can join this as a reader or as a writer. And there's a lot going on. There's a few of these book clubs, and they're brilliant. Um, and UK Crime Book Club has decided to, to take the bull by the horns during the lockdown. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're up to on that? Yeah, in the last, in the last fortnight, we've taken an idea for an online festival for absolutely nothing to 40 authors. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. I've put the um I've put the um details actually in the comments to this broadcast. So if you look around, you'll see a large JPEG which has everybody's name on it, which includes Brilliant. Ellie Griffiths, Luca Vesti, Howard Linsky, Trevor Wood, um, Mel Comley, Callie Taylor, CL Taylor, sorry, Mark Billingham, Denzel Merrick, Lynn Anderson, Graham Bartlett, MW Craven, Leslie Thompson, Will Dean, Vasim Khan, Francis Brody. Um, and it's it's been great seeing it. It came together very quickly. Um, but do you think things like this is this for the first time you've done this because of lockdown, and you're going to be doing it to the first of third May on Facebook? Yeah. Um, but because you've done it on lockdown, do you think you're going to? Do you think some of this will leak out of lockdown? If you know what I mean, when we're finally well, allowed out of the house. Well, um, <laughs> I've actually been in contact with Navar at the bar, and I'm going to set up a Nottinghamshire chapter of it. So yes. Oh, that's fantastic. It is good. Yeah. Well done. That is amazing, Alex. What a thing to do from, you know, from what a great and creative response to, 
you know, this, yeah. well, so the rest of us were sitting around going, I can't possibly write during this time. <laughs> Where's you organising this? I know, it's great, isn't it? Um, you know, I'm so used to sitting around doing nothing. Everybody was online, so it's people to talk to. And it, it just seemed logical, really. Yeah. Right, it is. Um, and, and there's a few of you involved in it, uh, in organising it, and kudos yeah. to you all. It's been great seeing it come together. Um, but when you're saying that, Sarah, you said jokingly about for yourself, oh, I can't write. Actually, a lot of the writers I've been speaking to over the last few days are actually finding it um, quite hard to get yeah, on with that stuff. Definitely. And I don't mean to sort of belittle the struggle because I felt exactly the same for the first about three probably four weeks of all of this mm -hmm. um you know it was just for, apart from anything else i mean this myth that we've all got more time on our hands than we had before well first of all no you don't if you're working from home and you've got children and you've, yeah. you've previously been able to carve out and they're all they're all home with you so that first of all that's a nonsense and second of all you know everybody is you know beset by worry of one kind or another aren't they so and worry gets in the way you know it fills your head like nothing else so to carving out the headspace to be able to write is really difficult but i think i came to conclusion about the end of last week i think that i was starting to realize that um telling myself that i couldn't possibly write because i was so empathetic and you know i i, I was too involved in the plight of the world which you know i am empathetic and i am involved in the plight of the world but i realized i was sort of like that was it was almost like someone had given me the perfect prevarication you know, mm -hmm. it's much better than I've got to clean the, the kitchen floor or rearrange the cupboards. You know those things we say to ourselves to put ourselves off from writing? Yeah. Uh, and I think it seemed to me like it was becoming one of those things. And actually, you know, when you think about, you know, the people who are getting on and doing the job of work that they have to do, I mean, the heroes, you know, the, 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 the carers out there and, uh, you know, the shelf stackers and all of those people. And I just feel, well, no one's giving them headspace are they to sit and worry about the world you know they've got to get on and do it so I just you know told myself I've got to write through it you know like anything else you've got to write through it if you've you know and, and also if I had a deadline I'd have to be writing through it I'm actually in quite a lucky position at the moment and I don't have a contract and a deadline that I have to work towards because I'd finished my book before this happened um, I also, in fairness, I also had a flavour of self-isolation um, back in February before all of this because I'd been in Japan in January. So we were we were given two weeks of lockdown, sort of voluntary lockdown before all yeah. this began. So I feel like I've had more time in some ways to process that aspect of it and um, to make arrangements for how the house runs and those sorts of things. Yeah, and Caroline made the point is like, you know, actually, not only do we have less time, but we have less privacy. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. On their own, and, that, and that's a different sort of stress. And there are plenty of people on their own. But you know, most households are actually having that quiet time where you can actually think and do any sort of creative work become quite hard, really. Very. Um, but having said that, as I am, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm quite thick-skinned, and I find that I've been, or unimaginative. I don't know. I've just been writing through it in a weird way. I think I cherish that bit of my brain that is going ah. I can't hear any of this. I'm just going off to my own world now and inventing stuff. But, you know. I think um, that's what writers, fundamentally, that's what we all do, isn't it? I mean, that's why we're writers, so that we can invent worlds that we're able to control and circumstances that we're able to control. And we can, you know, make happy endings for the good people and, you know, you know, deal justice in our way to the other. So it's our way of ordering the world. That's how I've always seen writing in one sense. Yeah. So it's it's actually in some ways should be quite a refuge if you can carve out the time and the peace and quiet, as Caroline says. And if you can't yeah. do that, then it just becomes incredibly frustrating because you want to be doing it, but you can't because everything else is getting in the way. And Caroline, in her, in her business, she's also saying she has to have a gap for the Shaw Show, as she's now calling it, which I quite like. When I did say mm -hmm. to Jane, my, my wife, that, I was, that I'd called it the show, she has been taking the piss out of me relentlessly since then. So, uh, um, yeah. Alex, tell us what you've been, what books you've been reading or listening to. Do you call, when you say, when you go through an audiobook, do you say you've read a book or do you've listened to it? What do you do? Um, do, you do? I, I, I just say I've read it, but lots of people, lots of people give me locks and go, "Well, you haven't, have you?" Yes, you have. You've experienced it. You've connected yeah. to it in the way it's a that, different way of reading it. But yeah, what have yeah. you been up to recently? Then anything that you'll be reviewing coming up? Well, I've just finished reading um, Sarah's fourth book with Imogen Church narrating, of course. 
Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The absentism church. Yeah. How did you find it? Yeah, very, uh, very um, interesting because, uh, you know, um, it was quite novel thinking, actually, I'm going to actually see the person. I've just been hearing all week, but obviously <laughs> that's not worked out. <laughs> you will do. Imogen Church will be on this broadcast or another one. If she doesn't make it by half past, then I'll get her on another one because she's just sounds such good value. And also, I think she also narrated the E.L. James books as well, didn't she? Oh, you see, I didn't know that. I just I know that. need to know how you swap from doing an E.L. James book to doing a Sarah Hillary book. Wow. <laughs> but all for making it clear that there is a distinction between them. <laughs> <laughs> to be made <laughs> Thank you, it might be i mean I, you know i find i mean thinking alex i really like about the book i think there's an element of of um realism in sarah's books that there probably isn't in the el james books i think they really you know i think they come from, they're, they're grounded in a very very real world of of individual relationships and and, and crises actually uh, and yeah, really, yeah. That was definitely re prevalent in someone else's skin when I first heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, Nick Quantrill, a great writer himself, asks a um, question for Alex and also Sarah. Um, what makes a good audiobook? What are the key qualities? He's, um, he's even he listen to them much. Did, did you ask me if I listen to them much? Well, I was, I was going to say, I was going to say the questions for Alex, but uh, as, you know, you can answer it when um, when he leaves gaps. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm just. Uh, what makes a good audio book? It's got to be um, a, a good length, which is probably between ten and twelve hours for start. Anything shorter might be a bit too short. Um, the narrator is essential. Yeah. Um, and and then one of the things I've found really irritating is when authors don't use cha chapters because it's harder to find out where you are on an audio book because you visual aid. So please, could audio companies ask the authors what they wouldn't mind whether they put whether they allow them to put chapter chapter marks in whether right. they were in the original book. I know we've got, I know we have Isis Audio who uh, publish my audio books, the ones that um, uh, Imogen Church narrates. I know they're, they're part of this discussion because I've seen their hello yeah. guys. Um, so um, I don't know who, who it is from, from Isis Audio here, but maybe they'll be able to, um, you know, take that away, Alex. I think that'll be really good. I, I think so. I, I think all authors would like to see more collaboration in that thing, because I think traditionally it was just something that was done afterwards. Yeah. And I think we're all now realising how important it is to a lot of readers. Yeah. And, actually, you know, what really intrigues me is there's a lot of uh, psychological fiction in which the narrative voice is a really, really important part, because sometimes the narrative voice is concealing things. Sometimes the narr narrator's changing quite a lot. And you might actually deliberately not be supposed to know who's narrating it. There's all these sorts of things which change and are very book specific. And, are, and are actually writers are quite creative people and they wouldn't mind. I know it's very important and very often actors don't have a huge amount of time to get the um, books done. But I would like to, um, you know, I'd really like to think that we could offer something to that. And actually, so that when, if they were to say, well, could you mind putting chapters in for this? You know, if I'd written chapters that were 5,000 words long, I'd happily find ways of dividing them up for the narration. Yeah, I think that'd be a brilliant idea. Yeah. And I, think, it, I think also because, as you said, Alex, I mean, they're really important to you, audio books. Um, and I think they're also, you know, they're really important to visually impaired people. You know, there's all kinds of people for whom audio books are the main way in which they're connecting um, with, the, with the words. And for, certainly, you know, I'm sure you'll agree with this, William, and all the other writers, um, joining in with this would agree that we're all about connecting with the readers you know we don't have any obstacles in the way of the reading yeah. experience of the story that we want all of those things stripped away um so i said i know i would and also the other thing is there's a joy to um i don't know if you feel the same way william but when i listen to my books being narrated by imogen i like them so much more than i do when i'm mind you i mean you know you hate them pretty much by the time you finish with them don't you when you 
read them and reread them and rewritten them and copy edited them and all the rest. It's you know you you're sort of ready to move on to the next thing. But there's something about somebody taking bringing those characters to life and Imogen j did it brilliantly. There's a character who's only in one scene in um, Quieter Than Killing. Um, and she was just, she brought it to life. She was so colourful and so amazing. And I'd almost forgotten I'd written this scene and this character. And she yeah. just, she should have jumped into my head, you know, fully formed. And in a way, and I felt in a way that I hadn't really, I hadn't created that character. Imogen created that character. I'd just sort of drawn an outline and she'd just done this amazing animation with her voice. And um, so there's always something, I think there's an experience, you know, there's a joy for the writer in the way in which our books are transformed into into audio books and i would love to be a bigger part of, of that uh, process anything that could help that process like you said. I, I have utmost respect for um actors and like it's something you just like you draw when you when you hear an actor doing your own thing you think oh blimey they really know what they're up to i did a radio five series years and years and years ago i wrote a book about religious cults and i had to have um i forgot his name though the guy who um had the waco cult um and I, I had all these lines from him and I had them in my scripts and they said, oh, we'll just get an actor to read them. And the BBC had these actors just sitting in the studio downstairs they can call up. Wow. And so this guy came up and did a Texan accent on, on this sort of thing like that. And I was going, because, you know, it's just, they just sit there, they read a bit of paper twice and then they do something quite magical with it. Yeah. And I think it's, it is great. I know it's an obvious thing to say, but they're not actors for nothing. They work yeah. quite hard to be those people. Yeah, um, I think they do their own words. It's just it's, oh, it's I know, I, well, I like all writers. I do that thing where you know the final read through of the book before I send it off to my editor is the one where I read it out loud. I mean, I think we all do that because that's often you spot things at that point that you hadn't noticed in any of the read throughs. Um, and so there is a um, an Irish character in the Marnie Rome series. He's not in the, the latest book, but he was certainly in uh, Quieter Than Killing and um, the book before that. Um, and um, so I was reading him <laughs> in the accent. <laughs> it sounds awful. Um, and um, my teenager came up to the room, which he never normally does when I'm reading my books. I'm not re fully reading out of the megaphone. You know, I'm just reading it, you know. Um, and, she, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm reading my, my book out loud to help you. He said, but what are you doing that voice for? And I said, well, this is the character's voice. And he said, no, no. That isn't, I don't know what you imagine, but that is not a valid voice. <laughs> and so now, and then of course I listened to Imogen doing that character's voice um, and it's just magical, you know? And But the mm. fact is that she can do that and have a conversation. You know, she does my detective Marnie Rome and then, and then she does this, you know, and then she switches to this Irish prisoner's voice. And, and it's just to be able to hold the conversation, to be able to act that, you know, all those voices to hold oh, them. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hang on, it's oh, that, that was possibly the most exciting moment <laughs> of that lockdown. Was. That's my <laughs> husband <laughs> got me in. Yeah. You've got, got another app on. Um, I am oh, so sorry. sorry. It, it told me I could get in with YouTube, 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 and then when I tried to get in with YouTube, it kept kicking me out, but we found a way. Imogen? Yeah. You've got an echo. Right. Huge welcome. You've got another app on there somewhere, uh, or another window. Um, so you, oh. you, the voice is going around twice. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. It's quite Doctor Who, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I found it. Oh, it's there. I found it. It's there. I found it. It's there. I found it. Oh no, she's gone! No! <laughs> but the, honestly, oh, yeah. this, this tells you, William, have you ever written a book this this exciting? <laughs> this is, I mean, you know. Live TV. <laughs> I know. Oh, well, that was it. Anyway, that was Imogen Church. She was great. <laughs> she was. I hope she'll be back. I think I she, she, back. she had somebody that, helping her there, didn't she? She, she did. So maybe the helper will. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to go. Andy asked a really good question there, um, which I'm always really worried about. And this is why I find it really hard to read, to listen to my audiobooks, is does the. Um, voice of does Imogen's voice take over your head no no I don't I don't find that at all and in fact the um there's the, the, the two separate pleasures for me listening to Imogen read I I'm so I I like to think I mean I the people that are looking forward to the next installment in the Marnie Rowe books you know waiting to see what I've done well obviously I know because I've done it but for me the big 
that waiting for the next Sarah Hillary book it basically becomes waiting for the next Imogen Church audio book because it's right. it's so different. She does something. I don't know what it is that she does. Um, my, my first ever experience of having something of mine read out was um, I won an award for um, from the Sense charity, the people that work with um, the deaf blind children. Imogen's back! Hey! Hey! He's here! Fantastic! Oh, I'm so ashamed. I'm so sorry. I was no, no, no. the whole time, screaming at the computer. I love audiobooks too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I am, no, I am sorry because I realise, you know, it would have been sensible to put some clues about how to do this. Do you know, I've done loads of podcast interviews and I've never had to be a member of a certain site before to do them. So I, I checked yesterday because my stepmom, Neve, was like, I bet you have to have Facebook. And it said I could use YouTube, which I have, and then it wouldn't let me in. I'm so, so sorry. So I thought the best bit was when Facebook were telling you you were a scam. Yes, you weren't allowed to create a Facebook profile. It kept sending me these emails saying, we're going to email these four people and send them a code. They then have to tell you and you have to input it. One of them was a boy I went to school with and haven't seen for over 20 years. Oh, my God. I was like, that's too weird. Yeah, that's I'm really weird. with that. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm here. I'm so yeah. sorry. Welcome. <laughs> But very big welcome. And this is Imogen Church, who not only narrates um, Sarah Hillary, but also Ruth Ware. Yes. Rowan Coleman. Yes, I've done a Val. Did a Val McDermott. She Alex Marwood. Day, wasn't she? Yeah. Yes, she was. Yeah. She was here. Yeah. yeah. Alex Marwood. Yes, Alex yeah. Marwood, Claire Donahue. Loads of thrillers and also loads of comedy. And yes, I did start in audio porn. Thank you for yeah. that. <laughs> It was on your website tucked away in there, so I had to bring that up, really, because it's interesting. Um, and, and also, I just think it's amazing because acting is a tough, bloody gig, and to find a space in it where you can actually earn a living and do something really interesting and actually then find followers because people actually, there are people who are listening to our books, well, not mine because you don't read them, but to Sarah's books because, because you narrate them. Do you know what I mean? The narrator has become a it's sort become of... It's become a big thing, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I have a lot of people get in touch and tell me that the audiobooks they pick, they pick because I've narrated them, which is really nice. Yeah. Also, the, the big thing for me was that for years, because I'm almost six foot tall, and for years I was just being told, you're too tall, you're too pretty to be quirky, but you're too quirky to be pretty. Mm -hmm. And also being told I couldn't do anything with my hair, I couldn't get tattoos. Mm -hmm. And then when I discovered audio, I thought, this is amazing. No one's telling me to bleach my teeth or lose weight. I can tattoo myself. I've currently got a mohawk. So not only have I managed to find, as you say, a space where I'm working constantly and paying all my bills and have been for a decade, I, I'm free to be me and do whatever I want to do, which is wonderful. Yeah. I'm catching up with the many comments here. Oh my God, there's some amazing yeah. comments. I particularly like the one about <laughs> falling through the through the floor like a trapdoor in a pantomime. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I mean, it's, it's, true, it? it's true, isn't it, Alex? I mean, uh, audiobook listeners actually now follow as much you know if they if you the narrator is so important to the book that you'll follow you know you'll actually follow that link as much as an author's name won't you definitely yeah i found that yeah absolutely i must admit though i find it rather strange listening to imogen read a sarah book and then an alex marwood book because i get the characters confused because <laughs> it's the same voice isn't it so it's an <laughs> So I have to have a larger gap between those authors because it's the same narrator. So, yeah. That's a really good point, actually, yeah. Because my, my stroppy teenage girl is probably the same in most books. So she, well, would, she would ju uh, book jump. Well, I'm very sure. happy to share stroppy teenagers with Alex Marwood. So <laughs> I'm on have that bridge <laughs> when you are doing a series and you've done five other books in between and you come back to the next one or probably more yeah. you have to, have to listen to yourself to work out whose voices you used i have to make considerable notes when i've been doing something as long as i'm doing sarah's books 
obviously those characters, which I love about a series, particularly Sarah's books, is that they just become part of you and you become so familiar with them. Noah is my best friend and Marnie is just me on a bad day. Um, so those are not a problem, but the, the smaller characters, you have to make notes because like you say, I mean, you know, a book a year in a series, you can't wait 12 months and try and remember what the pathologist at court number three sounded like. So yeah. the only problem I have is that I make notes, um, written notes, I don't keep files. So sometimes I'll make a note like, bit fat likes cheese. <laughs> and I don't really know what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write that character in the next book. Obviously, you you get a chance to read the book, but do you ever find yourself reading a book and and you know I I don't want titles here, but do you ever find oh god I hate this? <laughs> I yeah. Do you know what? That's a really common question. I call it turd polishing. <laughs> 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 There, there have been, and a lot less now, now that I kind of am very established and have a name, I get so many wonderful books. It's really rare to get one that I don't love. Right. But um, certainly in the early days, there was a lot of turd polishing. Um, and one book in particular, again, I can't say the name, but by a very famous author, where they asked me to use a pseudonym because I had narrated audio erotica. And I said, I will gladly use a pseudonym. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. I'm fine with that. So yeah, it's it's hard. Those days feel like work. All of the other days, I can't believe it is work. I can't believe I get paid to do it. It's insane. It's such a privilege, such a wonderful job. But you're so brilliant. You when you when you watch this back later, you can see it all, you know, um on your scam Facebook account. Um <laughs> You'll um, you'll see the praise that we were lavishing on, you know, in particular, uh, was lavishing on. I was saying that, you know, where I'm told readers are waiting for the next Sarah Hillary book to come out in the series to find out what happened, you know, what awful things I've done to know this time, etc. <laughs> um, but um, for me, it's that that my big excitement is is the is the next um, Image and Church reading of my book because it feels like a completely different book when I listen to you reading it and a much better book than the one I wrote. No. That was so brilliant about it. It's like. And I was the things ever great though, or are think when things when people turn out the way perhaps you hadn't heard them in your head, does it great or do you go, oh well, hello, I like that? I must admit, I must admit, the very first time I ever heard you read Noah, mm. I, was, I was quite shocked because you um because I think it's because you you go in with Marnia to low register and she's quite low and gentle yeah. her voice, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then you go, obviously, lower. For, <laughs> but the first time I ever heard it, I was like, my God, no, you're butch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it is to survive in the police force. I know. I just love it, though. And I, and, but the thing I was saying, um, again, you can watch this on the, on the watchback, uh, listen to it on the watchback, but um, was the, um, the character in Quieter Than Killing, the, the girl that finds Noah when he's been attacked, oh. and he, and that character, there's something you did with that character. I didn't even remember writing the character. Oh, and wow. In that one scene. And it was <laughs> such a joy. It was like I was reading, yeah. it was like I was listening to somebody else's book, someone else's words. It was amazing. Oh, lovely. Never forget that. That was the sort of like the perfect moment where I had no idea how colourful and wonderful that character was. You thought, bloody hell, can't believe I wrote that. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have a comment from somebody called Neve Church who says, <laughs> Yes, I told you you should join Facebook yes. Imogen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you were right again. <laughs> she's actually saying she's proud. Oh, no. <laughs> she likes your floppy scarf, and so do I. Thank you. So I saw someone else say she is working the Mrs. Mop look. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. It's good. I mean, Booker says more praise from Imogen from Mel. He's he he shares a house with Mel McGrath. And also, you apparently you narrated his first crime novel, so... Um. Yes! Yes, Simon Booker! Yes! Oh, it's, I find it really fascinating that I seem to... I mean, I do all sorts of genres, but I mainly work in either thriller or comedy. Right. 
which I find fascinating because I kind of imagined that people would pigeonhole you. But I appear to have um, transcended that and can either do grisly death and butchery or fun kind of... You sometimes get it confused, though. You know those comedy comedy morgue scenes? Well... When the comedy help, lover is eating... Help, help adding a little bit of humour. Do Here's a question for you, Sarah. Do you feel that a good thriller needs moments of levity? Oh, God, yes. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to Luke Jennings about this actually. Um, um, day before yesterday, we were recording for the big book weekend, and I was talking to him about Killing Eve and, and how very important the humour is. Yeah. And I was saying the yeah. only other thriller writer that is I'm very different who is doing humour um, mm. is is Mick Herron, Um That I'm aware. I know there are some yeah. other th humor humorous elements in thrillers, but those are the two examples that st stood out for me. And I do think I think just generally the darker you go the more you need some light to balance it out anyway. Yeah, particularly now, particularly at these in these times, yeah. I feel you need some respite. Yeah. I did actually narrate one of Mick's, one of his standalone ones. That's great. Um, oh, God, I've forgotten what it was called now. What? Um, there's, there's a girl in a basement. What happens and, next? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's I absolutely yes. loved it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway. But I did, yeah, no, I definitely think, I mean, and that's why, I mean, so I made a point deliberately of, of creating those bosses for Marnie. Yes. You know, read them brilliantly, <laughs> particularly the new, North, you know, the Northern woman. Yeah. Because yeah. that gave it such sort of warmth and, uh, you know, sort of, um, and lots of humorous one-liners and stuff like that. But no, yeah. that is absolutely essential, I think. And that's what, there's no coincidence that when you have morgue scenes in TV dramas, there's often a bit of humour in there. That yeah, the yeah. Ones have that, don't they? They have the pathologist eating a burger or... Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, like rolls. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, and as you say, in these times. Yeah. Do you ever get a, a script and have delight because there's a character... I mean, I'm, I'm, in my latest book, there's a badger. Oh, I love animals. Oh, nice. Rating animals. I just did. I last summer I did My Little Pony books. I was so oh, excited. Okay. Is that My Little Pony tattoo? I my Little Pony tattoo. Very good. Which dashes cutie mark. Very. Oh, very good. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that would be brilliant. I would, you know, that would that would be a job, wouldn't it? Narrating William's Badger. Oh, that'd be just fantastic. I love animals. I just did a fantasy quadrilogy, 2,000 pages, all in a row, which was convenient for me, by Sarah Kozloff. It's her debut, and it was absolutely full of whales, fantastic animals that don't even exist, giraffes, dogs, cats, and I loved it. So what's your badger like? Well, I haven't had. I haven't had that. I've just spoken to the to the, a really brilliant woman who really makes them called Jack, Jasmine Blackborough, and she she wouldn't tell me what what voice she'd used for it, but she said that she had to name it. It's got no name in it, but she had to give it a name in order to, to be able to narrate it, which I thought was very Barney. sweet. Was it Barney? <laughs> if I remembered it right, Barney the Badger. That's right. <laughs> I thought you said, "Is it Marnie there?" And I thought, "Well, that'd be interesting." <laughs> I know. I, that, that's it. I'm having an animal in my next book. <laughs> I've, got, I've got animal envy now. Can yeah. I can I ask Sarah another question? Is that okay? Oh, go Sorry. on. No, it's your show. <laughs> I am fascinated by the character of Stephen. Oh yes, and I'm interested to know if you did research into that kind of background. So I'm an adoptive parent. I have a traumatized child with additional needs and there were a couple of times where I was like I can't believe Marnie's parents did that mm. that was the worst thing they could have done in terms of looking after Stephen so did you kind of research that background or did you just think yeah, I did an amazing, I would be like? yeah, no I'm um I probably did less research than I should have done especially if you were if you had that reaction to it um, I suppose I I tend to sort of retrofit my research, so I'll create characters and stories first, and then I'll go and try and make sure that I've not. Yeah, I'm not saying it was the wrong choice; it was the right choice because for me, that's what pushed him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I wanted to make sure that the parents were. The conversation you know, should be going on when you're recording, surely. But anyway, um, <laughs> I was going to say, Alex, as a, as a consumer of these things, does actually watching Imogen 
has this lifted the veil and has this destroyed the magic? Have you seen behind the curtain now? Now that you won't be able to take any of these books seriously again. <laughs> no, it adds another layer to it, to be honest. <laughs> um, and I have interviewed narrators before on our website. So it's not completely new. Right. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I'm, I'm, I know that um, I, this has gone on 20 minutes longer than I, or no, 10 minutes oh, longer than I know. That's my it fault. Is entirely, well, it's entirely my fault for not giving you the, not giving you a proper introduction. But um, please, I think we need to have you back at another stage if you, <laughs> if you bear to have the login process again. And if you still have a, a hidden Facebook profile. Um, <laughs> Um, I've just got to quickly say that next week we've got Jane Casey, Lucy Atkins, whose book I think you just read yourself there, Sarah, and That's it's a crack. Abel Mukherjee, um, Liz Nugent, and Ed James coming on. Um, thank you, everybody. I haven't even had, there have been so many people commenting today. I haven't even had a time to acknowledge most of you. Um, but please carry on commenting in the comments. Um, please watch, um, please try and find on Facebook the UK Crime Book Club if you're not already a member and on that weekend of the 1st to the 3rd of May, see the brilliant festival that Alex has got organised and please yeah. listen to lots of books. Because can, I do, can, yeah, I do, can I do a little plug? Go on, go on, go on. Because I'm interviewing Ellie Griffiths and Mark Billingham. Uh, Friday, 7 to 8, Ellie Griffiths and Mark Billingham, 7 to 8. It'll be, it'll be an absolute cracker and you'll put my technical skills to shame, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> and also, just so people know, um, a lot of us narrators have home studios, including me. So we are still working, still putting out new books. Doesn't matter what happens out there unless I get it, obviously. But other than that, we're more popping. So there's still going to be new releases coming out. Do not worry. Fantastic. Thank God. Um, Thank you all so much. I'm going to press the off button uh, and see you all again uh, on Monday. Bye.